still a, a sizable um, sizable population, but um, there's a lot of people that uh, are supportive but uh, don't speak Gaelic. So we thought it would be worthwhile doing an event um, through the medium of English. Um, so uh, I'm pleased to, uh, my name's Christopher. Uh, I'm, uh, as you might hear, not from Scotland originally, I'm from the Isle of Man. Um, though I, I lived in, in Scotland uh, for a number of years. And, uh, but Jane, uh, Jane Nicloge is a native Gaelic speaker from the Western Isles, from Lewis. Um, uh, so welcome, Feskama, Jane. Feskama, and it's, it's going to be very strange indeed to be speaking English. I, I'm almost blushing at having to speak English to Gilakish, because I don't think we ever have, yes. or Martin, who is um, yeah, you know, Marston. Um, he has now become Martin, the second time I went to English. Um, but it's very nice to be here, even if it's strange yeah. to be speaking to each other in English. Yeah, and I think um, I, I I don't think I've I've uh, met you in person either. We've met through Zoom, various Zoom meetings mm -hmm. and things during uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, yeah. And uh, so yes, this is our, our first conversation speaking English. Um, so I, I thought um, the aim of this evening was. Um, uh, sort of give people a taste of um, what the issues are facing Gaelic speakers and, and why why Gaelic is a political issue um, uh, and, and uh, what the challenges are. So I thought we'd, we'd start um, maybe if you'd like to say a little bit about yourself um, and the place of Gaelic in your life. Um, okay then, well I was born and raised in, in Lewis. Um, my people have always been here, though some have gone off to Canada and then come back. Um, I'm from a very large family, from a family of eight, and I had the whole three generations in um, the same household that we all had. Um, we've produced another eight offspring. Most of them are off on the mainland now working. Um, chances are they'll come back. They're all raised with Gaelic as well. Um, when I was in school, I went through immersion English primary where we, you know, at the age of four, started to learn English as we were being educated through it and with all the phonics and everything that GME pupils from the mainland have to do now through Gaelic, we were having to do to acquire English. Um, so I have some sympathies with um, mainland learners, those um, we four year olds who have to go in. But my daughter's generation didn't have to do that. She was able to. Um, go straight into learning through Gaelic and it would for her generation be unthinkable that that she would that you would have to put your child into English education at, at the age of four or five so things have come along um, quite a lot um, my own background is just now from this point I'm a teacher but I've been around the houses I've lived down in England in the south and the north of England as well as a young adult come home here to raise a family. I've worked in Gaelic, you know, in Gaelic television, but also in um, for UHI. And I was away working as a Gaelic teacher in Aberdeen, which I loved, like the Hazelhead Academy. It wouldn't have left it were it not for the situation that we're in in the islands um, just now. You know, I, I, it's like nothing I've ever seen, really, what's, what's happened to Gaelic. I, I would not have believed it could happen in my lifetime in this place. And I suppose, I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we're all um, activists for Gaelic, because it's, it's really at a critical juncture at this point. So, um, yeah, so you've already hinted a bit about the, the changes you've seen um, during your lifetime um in your own community in lewis and and for those that uh, i'm sharing the screen now so hopefully you can see this map um uh, pointing out where lewis is in case anyone doesn't know it's the, the largest most northerly island of the the western isles which is the the chain of islands there um, in dark green uh the 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 color representing the um percentage of gaelic speakers i think this is last census or maybe the census before um, so relatively recent, recently, but the, this the situation is changing fast, and 
Um, if you look on the next slide, this, this will be familiar to many people, sort of the decline of Gaelic. So even a hundred or so years ago, Gaelic was widely spoken across the highlands in, in most of the area. It had been spoken for, for, um, uh, for many centuries and, and the, the decline, the, the loss of this Gaelic speaking territory as a substantial part of Scotland and the restriction essentially to the Western Isles and a few parts of the, the, the rest of the, the Inner Hebrides and the, and the, uh, the West Coast of the Highlands um, has been a rapid process over the last, the last few decades. Um, We'll come back to this um, the, the, the research publication, but, but just to say, um, Jane is also uh, Jane's a member of of Mishniach and and also a member of a, a new group, Guchn and Shiarach, uh, the voice of uh, the the west side people, um, so people west west side of of, of Lewis, and there's some of the the members there and. Um, so I thought the, the next topic would maybe if you'd like to just elaborate a bit on. In practical terms, what changes have you seen in terms of Gaelic in your community um, over the last well, over we've your seen, lifetime? Um, wider changes anyway that that impact on Gaelic. You no longer have you know the three generations in one household. That was you know it was the best possible um, situation to keep Gaelic going. Um, it wasn't necessarily the best situation for families. And I think there's a reason that we don't do it anymore. Um, and, you know, we have to adapt to that. Um, that older generation is gone. And, and we know anyway that Gaelic declines with every generation that goes. Um, they had very little education in English. We have just so much. It's coming at us all the time, especially with the internet and, you know, the media explosion. Um, GME has mm -hmm. come along and that has helped those who are able to access it um, with their literacies and with their confidence, but it hasn't been universally available. And those who didn't get to do GME um, are kind of outside of Gaelic when it comes to confidence, I think. And there's, you know, there's a lot of gatekeeping. Um, it's now a very contested um, Gaelic it all occupies a very contested space and a very controlled space and the control is from elsewhere. Other things that have changed is you know, um, my dad was a weaver he'd worked in Glasgow and you know he traveled everywhere but he came back here and worked as a weaver just to be here and that's gone so villages are dormitory villages same as they are anywhere else most people work for the council or the NHS or you know teachers or as tradesmen so villages are empty during the day by and large kids are with childminders or in in school and it, that's changed a little during lockdown and it might even be a shift in favor of Gaelic if more people are able to um, work flexibly and work from home I think we'll be able to you know root back down into being proper villages again um, but I guess what's changed is that the sense that Gaelic doesn't belong to, um, you know, a village. It's there's this standard Gaelic that that is controlled from elsewhere, and our own Gaelic isn't good enough. That that's always a, a refrain. Um, so I think that's really the main thing that has changed. Also, um, a lot of um, new people moving to the islands, newcomers, they don't have Gaelic when they arrive. A lot of them do want it, but we aren't anywhere close to providing what they need in order to attain fluency as quickly as, as we need them to, if we're going to be able to use Gaelic as a community language. So there's a lot that we need to do. Um, we have to actually become very structured about Gaelic. And that wasn't anything, it was just part of it was like the, the wind and the sun and, and the air. It was just there. It was like water. You know, you, we didn't have to think about where it came from. But now we really have to give it some thought, even to find someone to speak Gaelic to. You have to think about how you're going to do that. Quite often it's online chatting with you, Martin, and others. It's not with anyone here. Mm. Um. Very interesting. There's some 
yeah, some details there that I hadn't maybe thought about um, myself. Of course, not being from 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 there, although I am from an island, and, uh, mm -hmm. facing some of the same issues: the the need to move away, the not being sure if you'll come back, um, uh, and so on. Um, but um, we should probably uh, say a little about as was the the trigger to conversations around Gaelic uh, and the situation of Gaelic in the, in the islands um, uh, in the last few months. Um, so Mishniak has been, you know, um, putting out the message a few years now, um, but um, in terms of public awareness, things came to a head uh, in the middle of last year with mm -hmm. the publication of this, this book. It's a very thick, um, thick book of over 400 pages. It is, um, it's, it's an academic book. Um, it's, it's, it's quite, quite formidable, but it, it is um, printed in, in a paperback and a relatively affordable price. So they've made, these authors have made an effort to, to get it out there. And it, it, it's reached, I think, a, a wider public, at least in people being aware of it than, uh, than, than many research research mm -hmm. publications. I mean, it's, it's basic findings that Gaelic is rapidly, or the Gaelic communities are rapidly shifting to English as their default dominant language. Um, plenty of research has shown this for a long time, but this, um, this publication has um, definitely gained more attention, including by politicians um, since last, last summer. Um, so this is the, the Gaelic crisis in the vernacular community by Crocker or Gilligan and, and others. Um, and there's a, a map from the, the book um, showing the areas they, they studied. Um, so it's mainly, it, basically they set out to, to um, provide data on, on the demographics of Gaelic in those areas where it could still be considered a community language to some extent at least. So this means throughout the Western Isles and a couple of other places. So the north end of Sky and down the bottom, the Isle of, Isle of Tyree. Um, so that covers three council areas, Western Isles, uh, Highland and Argyll and Butte. Um, and the, this particular map is just one, one of the things they looked at is um, based just on census um, and they gathered a lot of data themselves. So it's, it's not just based on the census and one of their arguments is the census gives too optimistic a, a picture in, in itself um, but this is uh, 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 young people aged 3 to 17 in the different areas um, what percentage of them speak speak Gaelic um, or at least can speak Gaelic um, you see the Lewis there at the top um, um, so I think uh, the publication, of course, wasn't a shock to us and, and to anyone that's familiar with the um, situation of Gaelic, uh, Gaelic speaking communities. Um, but maybe it, it came as a bit of a shock, maybe to the wider public, including some perhaps involved with, say, Gaelic medium education outside the islands, um, that the, the, the narrative for the last two or three decades has been of a at least a modest revival uh, of Gaelic in terms of um, increased provision of broadcasting. So now several decades of Radio Nagel, um, and more recently uh, the BBC Alap, the TV channel. Um, Gaelic medium education has gradually expanded. Um, and in 2005, we got the first um, legislation specifically uh, promoting Gaelic, the, the Gaelic language act passed by the Scottish Parliament on a, on a cross-party basis as widespread support for it. It's not particularly strong legislation, but still it was seen, it was seen as a first step and it's it set up um, for Nagalic, the, the, um, the, the body that's in, in charge of overseeing various aspects of Gaelic policy. Um, I think there was a feeling among many people that, um, that now that these things had been achieved, there was um, Gaelic had reached a certain a certain degree of stability, um, but on the ground the picture is quite different. Um, so, I suppose just we're going to come back to this, I think. But what would you say, Jane, um, has gone wrong in terms of 
language policy in Scotland in the last 20 years? I'm not sure it's in the last 20 years. I think it might be in the last 40. I think, um, you know, the, the people who are um, at Ordinary Gaelic have kind of reaped the whirlwind um, for something that was going wrong before then, you know, back in the 90s. When, when I moved back here, I've been living um, in the south of England and, and came back in the mid 90s. And, I, you know, Gaelic TV was just getting going. There was the TV committee and it was this weird thing that just sort of landed like a spaceship on us. And it kind of went to people's heads um, to a lot of the committees and it it was all linked with prestige and with with you know the absolute antithesis of everything we associated Gaelic with. Gaelic was like a refuge from bureaucracy and you know this is a, a region that is just laden with bureaucracy because of of land and you know economic development and leader funding but Gaelic was always one place where you could um, escape that. And I think once it was taken up as a cause externally and bureaucracy got involved and it was that kind of um, slightly neoliberal um, bureaucracy at first um, and ideologies that, that just were against everything we believed in, that shift started then and people started to be triggered by by Gaelic and by this idea that it, it now belonged to somebody else and had to be standardized and measured and rated and there was a pecking order uh, that kind of ruined it and it switched people off from engaging with official Gaelic but still they had their you know community Gaelic um, but then through broadcasting and, and early GME and even things like the mod, there was this sort of sanctioned critique of colloquial Gaelic as, as not good enough, not high enough. And that did a, a immeasurable harm. And it's actually only probably since the year 2000 that, that things have started to get a bit more sensible and actually, you know, Gaelic is delivering something back, you know, it, it was a bit of a white elephant and not one that we liked very much. And there has been a reboot and things are, you know, I know as a teacher that, that there's a lot being done to save Gaelic, but I'm not sure others know it or trust that. And there's, there's almost a need of a, a new message of, you know, and maybe out with that, old all these old ideas that it's gone things have already changed and are improving and that it's safe to re-engage with it and i think it's at the point where it's just about safe to re-engage with it if you're fairly resilient so yeah this, is, <laughs> this reminds me of um uh, the words of joshua fishman famous basically the founder of language revitalization as a as an academic discipline um uh, he was involved with he, he was uh, a consultant for the irish government on irish language policy he was also heavily involved with the yiddish um mm -hmm. and, and his, in his book uh, reversing language shift um he actually i think he mentions Ga scottish gaelic specifically um as an example of um what goes wrong when you when you ignore the um, actual vernacular community use of the of the language on a day to day basis uh, for for uh, colloquial everyday purposes and concentrate just on what he calls high order props, mm -hmm. so you know prestigious bureaucratic mm -hmm. institutional things like broadcasting or education specifically, which yeah. is not to say those things aren't important and can't have a positive effect, of course. But the, the problem is that they, in and of themselves, without additional support to the communities, don't necessarily achieve what people think they're going to achieve and even can mask what's going on mm -hmm. at the, the lower level. Also, levels. he emphasised that it should start with the adults and not with the children. And I think mm -hmm. that, that um, 
like this other gal who got a hold of her children and mm. turned them into something else. And that there is a kind of schism um, now between, bet between generations rather than transmission. It's actually schismatic. Um, are you, you yourself, Jane, um, reacted to um, uh, the publication of the book. Uh, you were one of the authors of a series of articles that appeared um, in uh, Bella Caledonia, the, the online uh, magazine, um, which some of our audience may be familiar with. Um, uh, there was a, everyone should should go and look at the, the Gaelic section, because um, mm -hmm. there's quite a lot of, of good pieces, both in Gaelic and English. Uh, this one was was in English, so the vernacular Gaelic community in crisis, a, a, a liminal perspective, and I encourage everyone to to um, uh, to read it. Um, I've just got a, a chunk of it here. I don't know. Do you want to read it out, or shall I read? It? Oh, you read. You read on. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, a lot of parts of the article were evocative and um, striking, but I, th I thought just. This is a taste of it. Uh, Hebridean gales have been on a liminal journey like no other for the best part of a century. Journeys within journeys within journeys. In fact, early interventions by language planners were often uh, misguided and heavy handed. The sensitivities of pre-existing social and ed educational inequalities were exploited to render speakers submissive and mute. Uh, the elders, such as they were mere shadow men cowed by the overwhelming rectitude of experts who did not respect or like them or us. Um, everyone except us was permitted a voice and an opinion on what we were doing wrong. Um, almost anyone else who wished it could research us, but we were, we were not trusted to examine our own position and any desire to do so was dubbed nativist. We were deemed unsuitable to be, uh, to be leading ourselves, unfit to manage our own lands and resources besides. Because of this not so historic experience, many islanders are now alienated from the language and from much else besides. Having said that, a culture cannot easily be separated from its language, nor a language from its culture, um, however much of an inconvenience our continuing existence might be. So there is still hope. And uh, another, another little bit um, there. Um, while there is no peace or relief in this yet, because of the persistence of our external framing by adherence of monolithic institutions, there is now at least some hope of agency, some permission to act in our own interests and towards our, our own survival. Um, so I think you've touched on, on these themes already uh, this evening, but maybe you could expand a bit on, on what you, you mean here. I mean, for a start of what, what, what um, maybe what's, what's liminality um, that you mentioned, um, I, I, I could, but also I'd, I'd say it wasn't even a response to the book. It was a response to the backlash to the book um, that emerged at that time from the establishment. Um, just it was toxic. And but that has stopped now. It's gone quiet and there's some revisionism and maybe some progress as well. Um, but liminality is about betweenness and it's actually probably one of the best things about Gaelic, but it's also one of the worst places you can find yourself if it becomes permanent. Liminality is it's, it's just being between um, normal infrastructures and it's transformative and it builds community and it isn't anything to do with money or work or any of those things. And it, it's a uh, it's where you are if you're in a, an art gallery or if you're listening to music or if you're out in nature. It's that kind, kind of freedom, but it, it can, um, it, it requires some internal structure. And sometimes people can end up trapped in it and unable to transform and process through it to the next stage of their evolution. And that is very much what the gales were just trapped in this um, nowhere, this this just in a crouch, wondering where where you know all the certainties have gone, because Gaelic is it's in your head, and when you are not, when the thing that's in your head is triggering and makes you feel terrible, then you are in an awful place. 
culturally and socially and for many people personally as well and you know that needs correcting and it, it you know we need a process to get ourselves out of that but it has to be an internal process of leading ourselves out of it and making our own decisions about who we are because everyone's entitled to multiple identities and this is just absolutely at the core of ours i think that that summarizes very well one of the reasons why action on, on this subject is so important because it tends to get tends to get boiled down into is Gaelic going to survive or not? Will this policy mean that Gaelic survives or not? Um, will you, re you sort of reify Gaelic as a thing in its own right that has a life that you can do things to or do bad things or good things to? Um, it can be weakened or strengthened, but you know, there's no such thing as Gaelic as a as a single entity. It's Gaelic speakers, Gaelic communities in particular places and I think um, that often gets forgotten that um, the purpose of any type of social policy, especially for a, a historically oppressed or minoritized group, um, it's to help individuals and families and communities and so on as they are now, regardless of what the long-term future may help hold for their descendants or, or their communities in decades to come that's obviously a consideration that should be you know is, is important but it's how do we give people dignity and support uh -huh. in the situation they're in now um uh, because otherwise we condemn the, the gallic speakers of the western arts today <laughs> to what um, my own forebears went through in the Isle of Man, what um, people in the mainland highlands have gone through, the people, the, the rest of the, um, the Inner Hebrides have gone through or are going through this process of seeing, seeing your culture slip away around you. And, and even if the data shows that that's, or, to some extent that process is inevitable and in, in, in that you know some of it's baked in and can't be entirely mm. reversed you've still got to do something there's still a moral responsibility on those in power especially to do something yes especially when when policies have contributed even if it's not the current generation they're the ones who have to correct it and and a corrective is needed um, some of it has been external, some of it isn't just, um, you know, the way things are, you know, people want to live in, in the islands and they speak English, it's, it, they're long before then, if everything else were kept equal, this, you know, the relentless um, battering that Gales took at the hands of academia, um, you know, many, you know, establishment Gales, and education policy have done harm and continue to do harm. And it can be corrected. If it couldn't be corrected, I think we would just turn our backs and try to um, save ourselves in whatever fashion we could. But I think it is correctable. There wouldn't be any point in um, Kohuro Gilligan and, and Gordon Wells and all the others putting in all that work if they didn't think there was something to be rescued. And I would certainly agree with them. But there's a lot of work in it now. Um, I had I was speaking with Agam McLeod um, recently, and he said to me he had to retrieve um, the Gaelic that his family had lost and to give it to his own children. And he said, you know, I am what you will be in two generations' time. And mm -hmm. ten years ago, he wouldn't have thought that was possible. Mm. So. We, we really are at a most critical point because I think that the intergenerational transmission um, has stopped and we have to bring it to life somewhere else within our villages and, and um, online as well, of course. We have to make some effort 
to kind of rebuild our, our ship. And so you maybe have, do you have some insight into um, perhaps how that, what, what could be done in that direction in terms of um, restarting intergenerational transmission or encouraging young people or empowering young people to mm. use the Gaelic they have or to mm -hmm. acquire Gaelic and, and then use it? Or... Um, well, my, I come from education, so I'm always going to find you know, educational solutions to it. And I, and I think it is adult education for learners and vernacular Gaels. But somebody, say like Maggie Smith, who, who um, is a creative, would say it's through drama, through Gaelism and song, and others would say it's through sport. It's probably something of all of these things, but it is now coming together. And I think it, it does have to be um, from the grassroots and it has to be democratic. Uh, it's, I think um, we, we have to stop thinking that Gaelic belongs to um, GME or to the universities. And they have to accept that the Gaelic we have is actually just as good. And I think they need to maybe start putting some of that into their um, curricula to, so that they don't do harm because they have the potential to do harm. I think they have to have some regulatory element within them for this region. But they know that, that there is a bigger thing than GME or, you know, sociolinguistics. Um, so turning to um, the main recommendation of the Gallic Crisis book itself, um, so, um, is uh, towards the end of the book, there's a, a chapter on uh, solutions and um, they propose uh, the establishment of a Gallic community cooperative trust or perhaps trusts, network of trusts um, in the islands um, to undertake um, language uh, initiatives at a community level and with putting power in the hands of communities in, in some, with some kind of democratic forum as part of it. Um, and um, I mean, this is broadly in line with what uh, Mishniak at least have been saying for a while. So we were happy to endorse the broad outlines of this uh, proposal uh, after the book was published. And uh, we've incorporated it into our manifesto, which we've published for the um, uh, ahead of this election to, to try and influence um, the, the different political parties. We'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, but I know that you, uh, Jane, and Kuchen and Shiaroch and other groups um, within the, the communities have been looking at um, this idea in more detail and how, and I suppose, have you, um, how would it be more effective than what we already have? And, and how might it work in practice? And what are the obstacles to setting up this kind of structure and, um, and its successful operation? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, in, instead of what we already have, I'm not sure we have anything. You know, there is Board Nagalic at, at national level and there's the devolved responsibility at local authority level. Um, but in terms of voice, we don't really have anything for the vernacular Gael. You know, there is voice for, you know, in, in cities for, you know, coming in hand. Um, they can lobby for Gaelic schools and they actually have an amplified voice because there's hardly anyone else lobbying for anything else. Um, so as a, a, a structure that, that lets people debate, you know, as you would in a council or a, a, a union or was it Tynewald you have in Ilan Ilan Vanny, Isle of Man? <laughs> so that kind of structure, which is actually about ideas and agreement on things. I think that's the most important thing that it could bring um, to bear for us is to have this this um, this model to work with. And I think it would give us some cloud for and would actually help you know, at national level, help Board Nagalic if we're able to lobby at the local level for our local authority to fulfil on 
you know, all the infrastructure and, and provision that there is for Gaelic, um, then that would be helpful for everyone. I, do, I don't see what could possibly be wrong with it, um, as long as it was very incremental, I think, and very one level. Um, that's probably my Presbyterian side. I think the, the other value is just um, just bringing a bit of balance to the national debate because at the moment there just isn't enough voice anyway. It's not just vernacular voice that's lacking, it's all those young GME adults from the mainland who are now, you know, they're losing their Gaelic and they have no community. Um, people, learners who want free Gaelic learning, you know, it's not to have to pay for it so that it's not some middle class niche. Mm -hmm. They want it to, and why not? And Gaelic learning in, in secondary, there are so many people who need to raise their voices. And mm -hmm. I think we could participate in all of those debates, but we could weigh in on, on quite a number of other things like research ethics. When people are researching us from you know externally, you know, where's the right of reply? Where's the the balance um, research that looks at the opposite question of, of you know the problem of the gale? Um mm -hmm. little research that that um that is properly balanced as far as I've seen. You know, the Gaelic is uh, Ian Swinney said it was Scotland's number one economic asset. So if that's the case, you know, we're the ones speaking it. How come we're not part of that deal? You know, we're just, mm -hmm. there's something a little subordinating about the way things have been set up just now. Like we're there to provide for others. And I think we would have a bit more clout if we were organised. And I don't think we'd do anyone else any harm, but we would do ourselves a lot of good. And I see no reason for anyone to object to that. No, very good, uh, very good points, points there. Um, um, so of course we are in an election campaign, and the reason we're doing these these uh, se seminars, whatever you want to call them, are, are is because um, the election is coming up, as it's the time to hopefully influence um, those in power um, in the direction of of uh, change. Um, so I think all the all the main parties have published their manifestos in the last week or so. Um, so I thought it would be worth talking a little bit um, about that. Um, this is on the screen now is um, a section of the SNP manifesto. Now, uh, Mishnyok is strictly non-party, so we're not endorsing this, um, but uh, of course, everyone knows that uh, the SNP are likely to be the, the next government again. Um, and to be fair, this is, they have the most detailed set of policies on, on Gaelic compared with the other parties uh, this time round, which is a big change since 2016 when they had like one sentence only on Gaelic medium education, I think, and a couple of other references, but um, this there's about 10 or so individual items in, in this manifesto. And this is just uh, some of the more interesting ones. Um, uh, and to, to mention, to be fair to the other parties, um, they all have, they've all, uh, I think, undergone at least a rhetorical shift in, in, in terms of talking about um, the crisis in, in the uh, island communities and also the link between Gaelic and wider socioeconomic issues, which was really missing from the, the discourse until recently. Um, so just to read this, this out, so this is the SNP's policies. Um, Gaelic is an integral part of Scotland's culture. We remain committed to ensuring it has a sustainable long-term future. In particular, we will have a focus on arresting the intensifying language shift in the remaining vernacular communities. So quite explicit recognition there of, of uh, the problem, um, more so than would have been, you'd have been hearing from politicians uh, you know, as recently as the, the last, the, the most recent Gaelic Language Act, which was really, oh, sorry, the most recent Gaelic Language Plan in 2018, I think, 
uh, which is really the spur of a lot of Mishnuk's initial activities. Um, then to ensure that the GME experience is truly immersive, we will have a general presumption against collocating GME schools with English medium schools. Um, that's a step forward, recognizing that the need for as much immersion as possible. Um, you know, and, until now, most GME provision has been alongside English medium education in the same school. So how this might work in different locations remains to be seen, but a recognition of that is I would say is a step forward. Um, we will also explore the creation of a recognized Gale Tuck um, for various purposes, but that's that's a that's new. Um, of course, Ireland has had uh, a legally recognized Gale Tuck, so areas that are you know with you know um, recognized as as Irish speaking areas and um, special provision, special um, policies and institutions for them really since since Irish independence in the 1920s and although there's plenty of problems with Irish language policy it's it's a, a, a long way ahead of Scotland in in, in many ways um, so some would say you know the existing system does already recognize the, the different profiles of different areas and, and that's built into the, the current system of, of language plans for different uh, local authorities and so on. Um, but nevertheless, perhaps this will be a chance to, to recognize that more explicitly. Um, and then we will review the functions and structures of Borg Nagalic to ensure Scotland has an effective leadership body and network of organizations for the promotion of, of Gaelic. This will include considering working with all authorities and bodies that have functions in arts, tourism, and heritage to explore what more they can do to help deliver faster rates of progress for Gaelic. Our last bit is just a bump that they've been doing already, but um, um, nevertheless, the, the Board of Gaelic has, has been in considerable controversy for sort of internal institutional issues in the last couple of years. So. Uh, a review of, of how it how it works is, is probably a good thing. And then um, we will also bring forward a new Scottish Languages Bill, which will take further steps to support Gaelic acts on the Scots language and recognise that Scotland is a multilingual society. OK, it's not a standalone Gaelic act, but maybe that's not a bad thing. I don't know. Um, um, at any rate, this will be the first uh, major legislation on Gaelic since that 2005 act. Um, so this is quite a, and there are other things in the manifesto uh, and in the other parties' proposals. So my initial reaction would be this is slightly stronger in some ways than I expected. I expected maybe a shift in rhetoric, but just one line saying we will support Gallic communities more, or, you know, something like that. So I don't know what what do you think, Jane? I just don't know because we spend a lot of time writing letters to government and, and not getting very fruitful responses. And our MSP um, finally wrote a letter and the response that came back just after um, Perda was that they didn't believe there was any need of an URUS and that it would be too, there was already too much infrastructure to shift. Mm. And yet now it's like, and there's going to be a guilt act. I'd say that's going to be a lot trickier to do than a wee would us out in the Western Isles. So maybe they're going to change their mind. Who knows? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, the biggest thing that's missing here, as you point out, is an explicit um, explicit uh, commitment to uh, Calic. So this is the Calic community cooperative trust idea. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, there are various things here where something on those lines might end up being the way forward if they want to achieve anything with a Gale Tuck. It will be a great, thing, to, a great thing want... for the Scottish land, for Scots. Yeah. I have to say, when I, when I first read um, your Gilligan book, my, I was living and working in Aberdeen, and my first thought, this is exactly um, what, what they need to do for Doric um, mm -hmm. in Aberdeen to empower people, because it's a grassroots working class language. It's the least advantaged people. You know, it's, it's potential for building people up and, and targeted funding. And I was as excited for Doric as I was for the potential for Gaelic, you know, in the naive belief that, you know, they would think, yeah, this is a great idea. Mm. Um, so and this is, 
who knows who knows what um, i think that the purpose is this is where the struggle will be exactly how strong these policies actually end up being when mm -hmm. these are quite vague commitments yeah on the other hand, there are a list of things that they will have to address to some extent. So each time the issue is raised, it will be a, an opportunity to push them. So that's one thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, politicians tend to be resistant to setting up new bodies. There's this perception of quangos and spending public yeah. money and bureaucracy and so on, some of which is, you know, justified perhaps. Um, so I think that the, the to push for something on the lines of the, the ORAS proposal, even if it's not exactly as it is, mm -hmm. you know, proposed in in the Gallic Crisis book, will can uh, will require quite a lot of campaigning, quite a lot of showing that that something on these lines needs to to be done, even if it's yeah. in terms of restructuring Port Gallic and making it a more some sort of more federal and uh, yeah. localized structure. I don't know, but um, yeah. but certainly the, the the model is is worthy of interrogation at least um and you know checking whether you know each stage of, of model all the way back to integration is workable is desirable um so that brings us to um i'm aware that, that time's getting on and we don't want this this uh um this event to go on too too long so um maybe we'll move on to um looking specifically at uh where do we go from here and how might uh, Gaelic speakers, supporters of Gaelic, Gaelic organisations um, work together to ensure that um, these proposals don't just gather dust or, or only appear in the weakest possible form? Um, there has been an upsurge of, of activism of various types in the Highlands and, and, and Islands and, and Scotland in general recently. Um, uh, Mishniach itself uh, was, was founded about five years ago or so, and we'll come back to talk about Mishniach a little bit more. Um, but it's not just not just the um, uh, campaigns focusing on the language itself, it's the, the, the housing crisis, uh, young people being able, unable to, to stay or move back, lack of jobs, insecure jobs, uh, infrastructure, the ferries, uh, um land and crofting issues and so on um so uh, this your own group in in, in lewis and uh, very recently a group started in sky in um and the people there are various uh, various things going on in in US, uh, as well um and more broadly a lot of these issues are being addressed by various groups various campaign groups uh, across scotland um, so I suppose, yeah, well, should we say a little bit about how, how do we make sure that uh, after the election, when the politicians are safely on their, their benches for another few years, um, that we hold them to their, their word? Um, I think we're just going to have to be very busy and any, any issue that is um, raised to do with Gaelic or, or to do with the islands, the region at all, um, we just have to be on it and I think it takes you know membership and and activism you know having supporters and many more people realizing that actually they can have an impact if if they come at something in sufficient numbers and they keep um keep coming at it but it's um it, it, I think it's through the media as well um, we've got um, with the starting with Gazette under new management. That's raising some hopes that it means our local authorities accountable and and agencies are accountable. It's it is just a matter of putting in the work and and having the expectation that it pays off at some point. I think that's the main thing. No, uh, I mean I'm i I would say I'm more hopeful in terms of organized Gaelic related activism achieving at least something now than I was when we started Mishniach. Um, maybe I'll say a, a little bit about Ooh. the group just for um, uh, those of you that are not so familiar with uh, um, Mishniach, the group. So we are a, 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 a 
independent um, organization. We're not the, you know, we're not the charity or anything, anything bureaucratic, bureaucratic like that. We're you know, a sort of pressure group. Um, we're a, a horizontalist organization, so um, we don't have like leaders and um, uh, loads of committees and things. We try to run the the, the group um, democratically um, and on and, and everyone on, on an even uh, footing. Uh, and our sort of um, approach and sort of beliefs are um, sort of a broadly broadly left wing progressive um, uh, uh, view, um, similar to language organisations uh, or language pressure groups in, in um, Wales, Ireland and, and beyond. And I think that's the big difference. And one of the reasons why things have come along further in Ireland and Scotland, of course, is the, the fact they have greater demographic base and the, especially in Wales, the, the, it's a fifth of the population, it's 10, I think, 10 times more speakers than, than with Gaelic. Um, but nevertheless, in, in the mid 20th century, the position of Gaelic and Welsh was not very dissimilar, next to no uh, provision in education, no official usage, no signage, no hardly any media and so on. And it, in the case of, of, of Welsh and also, in, to be fair, with, with Gaelic in, in a more fitful way, um, it was it was sustained campaigning that won things. Um, so in, in Wales, you had the Cymdeith Asariaith, the Welsh Language Society, established in 1963, and they've been going pretty continuously since, um, uh, you know, um, quite radical campaigning in terms of pro protesting and even civil disobedience, you know, um, going to prison for not paying a TV license, that, that kind of thing, sit-ins and, and, and blockades of roads and that kind of thing. I don't know if we're, we're at that stage with, with Gallic activism in terms of having Are you the, trying to seed a few ideas? <laughs> well, in terms of the numbers and, 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 and uh, sort of um, uh, basis in, in, in public opinion for, 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 for that kind of campaigning, but um, they, they also do a lot of the more boring stuff of writing letters, getting petitions signed, uh, writing policy proposals and lobbying or, you know, uh, going on at politicians until they eventually give in, I suppose. And they, they've been successful in getting a lot of their proposals um, actually adopted as, as, as government policy in Wales and thing institutions set up, most notably the Welsh Language Channel. Um, where they defeated Margaret Thatcher and, and made a, a got a, a rare U-turn out of her. Um, the, the difference with Gaelic is that there have been campaigns of that kind in, in Gaelic for specific issues or specific locations, it's just specific you know, Gaelic medium schools in particular areas. There have been some very, very impressive campaigns on a local level, but there hasn't been like a long-term, um, you know, a sort of go-to Gaelic pressure group promoting Gaelic in general as, a, as an issue uh, from this kind of perspective, partly because, you know, a lot of people that would have potentially been supportive end up working working for Gaelic-related things in other capacities in, in various, um, various other official bodies and things, which is you know, the pros and cons to, to sort of your talent getting co-opted by all these, these institutions and things. Um, so we saw a gap, especially after the, the coming in of the, the Language Act in 2005, um, where the, you know, all the energy had gone into that. And since everything had gone a bit quiet in terms of activism, when we saw we, some, a group of me and a few others, um, uh, I was in Edinburgh at the time, and there was um, a few of us in, in Glasgow and uh, across the, the, the Highlands and Islands and various places um, came, came together in local groups and, and, and um, you know, saw that things weren't as rosy as the official narrative had it. So I think that the first major step forward where we gained some profile and got in the media and so on was um, 2000, early 2018, I think, when the 
the Gaelic language, uh, Gaelic national Gaelic plan was published and debated in the parliament, which is has been a sort of ceremony, largely ceremonial thing where the politicians just slap each other on the back and say how great Gaelic is and how great they're what they've achieved um, for Gaelic as it has been without really addressing the substance of the issues. And uh, and this plan is, is drafted by Borg McGaelic and is sort of binding to some extent on, on government policy and various bodies for the next five years. Um, so there'll be another one in 2023. I don't know if the structure hasn't changed before then, but um, uh, in, in response, we set out our own sort of alternative radical Gallic plan where we 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 addressed all, all the issues that we thought were being ignored and, and, and set out the sort of proposals. Well, I mean, you know, the sort of thing we've already been talking about and we, we, we published something uh, um, the following year, boiling it down to, to five major points, which you see there on the screen. Um, uh, before COVID hit, um, a few months uh, before then, we we did a series of public meetings and talks um, uh, in various uh, throughout the um, islands, um, also in, in Glasgow and Edinburgh and Oban. Um, uh, you can see us there in the snow there with um, with some of our Welsh friends who, who visited um, just over a year ago now. Um, since then, of course, things have, have, have moved online and, and, and on Zoom and so on, which, which of course has its pros and cons. Um, but ahead of the, the, the election, we published this manifesto, which, which again um, uh, presents ideas that, that could be implemented, we think. Um, and, and it's hard to, hard to say how much influence we've had as opposed to other groups and other um, other people, such as the the Gallic Crisis book uh, and so on, uh, it's hard to tell who's had the most influence. Uh, I think there's been a confluence of people and, and groups, and then uh, seeing the same issues and seeing the problems, and, and, and um, there's been an upsurge of of people recognizing that. And, and so, I hope Mishniak has played a role in that and will continue to play a role. But um, yeah, that's our backstory, mm -hmm. I suppose. And the manifesto, of course, is kind of aligned point by point with, you know, you you um, cite um, Gilgan's work um, by way of um, uh, and, and action points for for some of the things he raises. And a lot of the other research um, and, and proposals that various people have published, and also international best practice. You know, we must look to Wales. We must look to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Basque country, Catalonia, uh, Quebec in terms of French, the places where language policy has been most successful or most thorough going, you know, mm -hmm. those are the places we need to, to learn from mm -hmm. as well, perhaps as, as smaller language communities that, that um, and the, the local level. Um, I think we've been we've been talking for um, about an hour now, mm -hmm. so um, it's been slightly longer than some of our so previous. My dog, my dog certainly thinks so. He's, he's starting to whine outside the door. <laughs> he's saying, "You've been in there well, long enough." Maybe we'll just do one last last point then. Um, um, I had a couple of other things, but I think we covered them to some extent. Um, but just a sort of longer term context, um, and and maybe where do you see things progressing in the next 10 or 20 years. And, and maybe we should think also about the, um, the wider situation that we're facing, not just a crisis of, of Gaelic and many other, many other minority languages around the world, but also um, climate change, the, the Western Isles being among the, on the front line of the, the rising sea levels and so on, um, uh, the housing crisis and various other economic uh, uh, crises affecting rural and island communities and 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 everyone else um i suppose what what are the opportunities for gales and their allies to um to to to, to um, paraphrase what your your article to to resist and overcome these monolithic forces mm -hmm. and institutions which which dominate everyone's lives am i supposed to do that in one sentence at the end <laughs> 
Is, is that uh, a great? I think it's. I think it's something a thought to leave with everyone. Um, not one. We can. We we don't know, even, you know, what we're going to be facing next month at this point. I think so. Maybe we do just have to set out our own strategies, and have safety net after safety net. But really, it's it's not something we should even have to think about. Um, we should be thinking about the environment. We shouldn't have to be thinking about Gaelic. Um, that should be whole and strong. We should be able to think about learners and um, think about, you know, just normal things. We shouldn't be in a position where we have to um, panic about the loss of our actual language that it's fragmenting in people's heads. That is not a good thing at all. Not a good thing. And, um, but I think uh, yourself and, and, and many others um, in Lewis and the Western Isles and, and beyond um, are doing their best to, to counteract um, the, the problems and the challenges. And uh, yeah, I suppose we shouldn't, we shouldn't analyze the future too much. We should get on with, yes. get on with what we're doing. And, um, and I suppose that brings us to the end of our, our discussion this evening. So more and Tang and Hulatinya, thank you all for, for, um, for listening. And if you want to, um, if you want to be involved with Mishnyak um, or, or support us in any way, including financially, um, you can go to our, our website, mishnyak.scot. Um, you can send us an email at fis at mishnyak.scot, so fis, F-I-O-S. Uh, and we're also, of course, on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. So, more than thank you, I guess, uh, thank you. Thank you.